Hi folks, Brian here. Welcome to another episode of Harmonic Leadership. And we're going to uh, pick up again the theme of inclusive leadership. And uh, as you can see on the screen here, we're now on page 27, picking it up from the previous episode. And again, I'll stress that these are important uh, episodes, important elements of the content that we need to spend time with and, and really dig deep and really be honest with ourselves as well. Uh, we, we need more honesty in the world surrounding these topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, but I like to relate it to more relatable things to, to help us to open our minds to, to what we're doing, to, to how we're approaching others, and, and how our emotions are likely showing up in the workplace surrounding uh, these important things. So at the top of page 27, you see the analogy of the music of inclusion. So I'm going to ask you to do a little thought experiment with me here. Let's say that you're in a gathering. It could be like a networking event or something. And let's say that there's uh, some music that you hear kind of faint on the far side of the room, but it's music that you really like. It's an artist you like, a style, a genre that you really like. So you just naturally migrate over closer to where the speaker is uh, so you can, you can hear the music. And when you get over there, you find that there's other people who really like that style of music and that artist and that genre. And you're all being bop into the music, you're dancing, you're talking about it, you're talking about how you love that artist, you're talking about your story surrounding that artist, and you guys form this in-group over by the speaker, uh, the in-group of people who love that style of music, that artist uh, in particular, and you really feel a sense of belonging. Uh, but think of a different room now where the music playing in that speaker is one that you don't like. And let's say it's being played kind of loud, uh, where it's pervading the room. And and the people who really like that kind of music, you see them starting to gather over close to the speaker. But you you try to get as far away as possible because you really don't like that style of music. And when you get to the far side of the room, as far away from the speaker as you can possibly be, so you're not hearing it blaring in your ears, you find others there too. And you all have this look of distaste, of disgust, like, why are they playing that music? Uh, why aren't they playing the music I like? And you can form this little out-group click of the selected people who are over there on the far side of the room to try to get away from the music, uh, that uh, you feel like you're not being included. And you can feel like it's actually offensive to you. And you gather with that out-group, uh, sharing that sense of, of distaste or disgust and, and feeling like you're being offended. So music preference is a very easy diversity element to, to uh, envision this on. Uh, music can bring people together, as you uh, see on the screen there in the middle part, or it can drive them apart. Uh, any diversity element can bring people together or drive them apart. So you can substitute any of those diversity elements that you explored on your song of diversity where you circled your uniqueness. Uh, consider any of those diversity elements and put them into the setting and you're going to see the same effect where in groups are forming and out groups are forming because of each of these elements. And when there's in group and out group, there's inclusion and there's exclusion. Uh, so when uh, people gather together through shared commonalities, uh, it creates a feeling of inclusion for them, but it's automatically creating an out group situation where people are feeling um, uh, excluded. And you see an important word here, this type of homogeneous group uh, creates a sense of belonging for those who gather with the in-group. Uh, homogeneous is a term that uh, is often uh, interchanged with homogenous, but it's actually two different terms. Homogeneous truly means that it's so much likeness that there's no diversity within the group. Um, so people are uh, made to feel welcome and worthy if they are part of that in-group, but they're made to feel unwelcome and unworthy. We're going to let that sink in. Unworthy. We often consider the unwelcome aspect, but we rarely consider that we are causing people to feel unworthy if they are feeling like they're in an out group. And I'm sure at some point in your life, you have found yourself in an out group situation. Think way back, might have been way back in school days uh, or early in your career or in some setting where you weren't the majority, you weren't in the favored set of type of people. And think about how you may have felt unworthy. 
and then consider the elements where you're in the majority, where you're in maybe the um, the, the 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 majority group, uh, the the driving group, the, the the primary culture within the group. You're in that setting, and think of how this may be uh, being caused upon other people who are in the out group and feeling unworthy. So again, as I said last time, I'm going to try not to get too preachy because this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart. And I think it needs to be near and dear to all of our hearts because so much of the pain in the world is caused through these in-groups and out-groups, through people feeling excluded and causing them to feel like they're unworthy. And I've worked with people, so many people, through the work I've done in the DEI space who are feeling that sense of unworthiness. And it's so painful to see um, all that they have to to experience. So the last paragraph on page 27 is putting you in charge of the music. So let's say that you have organized this party for your organization and you chose the music and you're blaring your favorite music on one side of the room and the people who gather with you are, are loving it and they're bebopping and they're loving uh, being near you and being near the music. But you need to consciously look at the other side of the room to consciously and, and be sensitive to those people who are not liking that music. And here again, you can put any leadership um, uh, trait within, within this scenario. What leadership traits are resonating with some people, but not resonating with others? And how can you ensure that that leadership trait is not causing that feeling of exclusion? So any, any diversity element, any element of leadership uh, can be placed within that as well. So it's our job to make sure that we're playing music that everybody can appreciate. I won't say like or consider it a favorite, but appreciate and changing our behavior in such a way that it won't cause people uh, to feel like they have to get away from it and get away from us as a leader. So the uh, next page on page 28, there's a, an activity to help you explore this. And I'll quickly describe it, and then uh, you can pause the video or, or do this on your own time. Basically, it's considering those diversity elements from your song of diversity, where you circled all of your unique elements. And list the things that you recognize are forming commonalities with others in this box. But also consider the things that are causing differences to show up with others. Note that it could be the, the same thing uh, that, that is causing both commonalities with some people, but differences with other people. Or it could be two separate diversity elements. Consider the in-groups that are being formed through that commonality. Also consider the out-groups that are being caused through those elements of difference. Consider the advantages to those who are within your in-group, but consider the disadvantages that are being put upon those who are in an out-group situation. And just understand that those in the in-group are feeling included. Those in the out-group are feeling excluded. And we could be the cause of that feeling of exclusion. So on page 29, I tried to cram this onto one page. Um, there are books written about uh, this, this topic. Uh, but I wanted to give you just a basis and also some reference points uh, that you're going to find uh, listed or, or named within text here. Uh, but also uh, you'll find direct links to research papers uh, and articles and books at the end of each of these chapters. And this chapter is especially important to further explore these. So um, this comes down to social science, basically. Um, and you see the first uh, topic there, tribal history. Uh, it's absolutely natural for us to gather together with people of likeness. We've been doing it since the beginning of humankind. Um, and there's some great work being done by Dr. Uh, David Amadio and his team uh, that you see there at the Amadio uh, um, social, social Neuroscience Lab at uh, NYU, and they partner with the University of Amsterdam. And uh, this, this, this tribalism is the major cause of, of uh, in-groups and out-groups. Um, and uh, these kinds of social um, categorizations are the core cause of prejudice. And prejudice leads to that discrimination that unfortunately is so, so prevalent in our world today. 
there's a term here that you're going to find back on the definitions page called xenophobia. It's basically the fear that we have of people of difference. And it's this form of tribalism that causes that. And here again, it goes back long in our genetic history. Uh, and those genes are still in our uh, genetic, genetic makeup. Uh, we are predisposed to this. So a lot of being a good manager is overcoming these natural tendencies so that we can embrace all people, even those that are genetic history, that are that are generational uh, uh, history that have formed formed us as who we are within our gene pool, um, even though that whole history is saying, don't trust those people because they are different. Uh, just trust people in your tribe. We have to overcome that. Uh, and it's, it's a daily challenge, but one that we have to overcome and um, address the challenge and overcome it. The, uh, the, the topics of in-group and out-group that we've mentioned a few times already and will continue to mention uh, was actually a fairly recent uh, nomenclature that was uh, formed in the 1970s by uh, the two psychologists you see here, uh, Henry Tajvel and uh, John Turner. Um, and uh, it, it all came about uh, because of this uh, feeling of social connection. Uh, and uh, they, they studied how and why people feel these uh, social connections or these social disconnections. Um, and within any workplace, groups are being formed, as you see here. They're, they're formed through a community, religion, political affiliation, uh, other areas as well. Hobbies and recreation, music, sports, other interests. Uh, consider those who have a favorite sports team come in on Monday after the weekend and they're they're talking about the the game and their favorite sports teams but if somebody didn't follow that team they followed a different team they may not be included so it shows up uh, in in all of these all of these ways uh, and it um, it causes belonging or disconnection so as a manager as a leader we just have to be aware that there are so many things happening within our team that are constantly causing in-groups and out-groups. And we have to find ways to have everybody feel as part of the in-group of our team. Um, next is a little piece on social constructs, social constructionism. And uh, back in 1966, you see uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman's name. Uh, they wrote a book called The Social Construction of Reality. And the bottom line is all of these things that we believe, uh, we believe through uh, um, not, not just the facts. In fact, often not because of the facts, but because of the constructions, the constructs that have been built in our minds and in our communities that oftentimes are not actually based on facts. And this also leads to many of the prejudices that we have in the world today, where a certain um, a social group has said that a different um, uh, group, a type of person, uh, was a certain way. Uh, and you see this show up through history, and it's showing up every bit as often today as well, uh, sadly. So uh, we have to um, uh, fight against those constricting false views that are, are not true reality, they're constructed reality through the social pressures. And then uh, the last little section there, opportunities versus limitations. And there's a couple of uh, key things here. Uh, I introduced the thought of an us group or a them group. And too often we approach the workplace thinking us and them. Um, not just the workplace, too often we approach life thinking us and them. So as leaders, we need to have more of an us mindset, not a them mindset, so that we find ways, we, we intentionally construct ways for everyone on our team to feel like they're part of us, uh, that they're part of the in-group that is our team, our organization, our company. So they can truly feel that sense of belonging. And there's a little activity on page 30 to help you to do this. Uh, it's called the belonging box activity and pretty simple to do. Step one is to look at the uh, big bounding box and you have space at the top to uh, list the ways that you strive to create a sense of belonging for those in your life. Those, those people who you, you intentionally create that sense of belonging with. Think about the things you do 
and uh, say to, to create that sense of belonging. Then in uh, step two, inside this current box, the subset box here, list uh, the people who you currently strive to create a sense of belonging for, um, both within work and personal areas of life. And you're going to see certain types, certain groups of people who you tend to uh, be doing that currently for. Uh, but then step four is <coughs> to, um, or I'm sorry, step three is to consider the future box. Uh, list the people who are within your life who you can better strive to uh, uh, create a sense of belonging in the future. And these may be people who are currently in your out group. Uh, we find in doing this activity, the current box is often filled with in group people. The future box is filled with out group people who you just haven't taken that intentional step with yet. And then uh, step four is to consider how to begin using the actions within the belonging box that you're currently showing to those in the current box and how to begin to show them to those in the future box. Uh, future box was intentionally chosen uh, to say that, um, that yes, I will endeavor to, in the future, uh, uh, reach out to these people and ensure that they feel a sense of belonging with me. And then a uh, last little bit on page 31 that will wrap up this section um, is to consider seeking and creating belonging. And there's a couple of analogies here I'll share with you real quickly to wrap things up that can hopefully help cement the concepts in your mind. Uh, the top one is the toy box analogy. So I'm going to invite you to think way back to your childhood as early as you can and think about your favorite toys, the toys that you most played with on a most regular basis. So get that picture in your head. Now, if you had a toy box where you kept your toys, or it could have been a closet or a drawer or an area of your room, Consider all of your favorite toys within that toy box or within that uh, space and how you would position them in such a way that you could get to your favorite toys most easily. Okay. Now, you have a picture now of your favorite toys in the space that you kept the toys. Think about the types of toys that they were. All of us as kids have certain types of toys that we naturally migrate to for whatever reason. But consider now toys that perhaps were given to you as a gift that you didn't like, so you never played with them, they got in a different part of your room or the house, and eventually they were probably given away to some other child who probably would appreciate that, that type of toy. So uh, this is another example of, of the current box and the, the, the future box from the page before. Uh, the current box is those toys that we loved, just naturally migrated to and then put in our toy box. And that's who we're currently showing that sense of belonging to because we're intentionally reaching out and, and creating that sense of belonging with them. Uh, the future box could have been those toys that we discarded that we didn't have that natural affinity to. Um, but as adults, we can overcome that. Uh, even if we don't have a natural affinity to a certain type or group of people, we can overcome that and we can create that sense of belonging. It's our job as a leader to do so, so that no one is sitting out there feeling excluded. Another analogy I often like to use is uh, apples and oranges. <laughs> um, it is absolutely natural for us to have bias. And when I, when I teach this topic, I often say, uh, all right, uh, who out there um, has a brain? Uh, raise your hand if you have a brain. And hopefully everyone's raising their hand and um, say, OK, uh, now raise your hand uh, if you have bias and people kind of shy. But the reality is, if we have a brain, we have bias. And an easy way to understand this is apples and oranges. Um, I have a bias towards apples. I really love apples. Uh, I have a bias against oranges. I really don't like oranges. Something about the citrus, something about the the uh, the experience of the texture. Uh, it just it, it upsets my stomach ultimately. So that's how that bias is formed. And it's fine because these are inanimate objects. And when I talk about apples, you can see that I'm more animated. My voice has a lilt to it. My eyebrows raise. I smile because I love apples. But when I talk about oranges, my face actually gets a sour look on it, a look of disgust or distaste. And my, my voice gets rough and gravelly, and I naturally do this. And it's fine because these are inanimate objects, non-feeling objects. But too often we talk about people 
and groups of people in these same ways. Oh, I love that person, or I love that group of people. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm not so sure about that other group of people. And you hear the distinction in the voice. Uh, and when there's when there's feelings and emotions uh, involved within the types or groups of people who we're talking about, uh, it can cause a ton of pain. So part of our job as a leader to is to really watch ourselves, filter our not only our words but our tone and our facial expressions, the micro communications that we'll talk about later in the book, um, so that we're not uh, causing. Um, um, and, and or situation, as it explains here. It's not a situation of apples or oranges. We need to create an and situation where it's apples and oranges. And being an and leader instead of an or leader uh, uh, places our minds on the path to inclusion and bringing a sense of belonging to both sides and everyone in between, even those who like plums or peaches or other fruits uh, will feel more included naturally since we're talking about and oranges. All right, so the last little uh, section here is uh, on seeking belonging and creating belonging. And, you know, each of us has a need to, to feel a sense of belonging. Um, very, very few people out there can, can go through their lives not caring, not attempting to feel a sense of belonging with others. Um, we each have it, and we as leaders have the opportunity to provide that to people uh, or to cause them to not feel it and, and the pain, cause the pain that's associated with not feeling that sense of belonging. So uh, if we have any amount of emotional empathy, we should be automatically striving to create this safe environment for everyone where they feel a sense of belonging. And uh, psychological safety, as you see here, was a, a term coined by Dr. Amy Edmondson at Harvard. Uh, and it's talking about that, that place where everyone uh, is accepted and feels safe. And just imagine the, the, the beauty of, who, uh, of how that feels for the people on your team and, um, and uh, uh, who, who uh, may not be feeling that now that we need to strive to create that sense of, uh, of belonging within them. Um, so we can, we can all find ways to do this so that our future team can be much more inclusive than our current team is. And even if we're, we're been on the right path, even if we've been doing a lot of the right things, there's always a, a greater level. When I look back on my long career, you know, 30 plus years uh, leading, leading other people, uh, I, I will readily admit I did not do a good job of this in my younger days. I caused a lot of exclusion and I didn't recognize it. I didn't see it. Um, and thankfully, luckily, I had some brave people on my team through the years who would step up and say, Brian, do you realize that so-and-so's feeling left out um, and, and not included? It's like, no, I had no idea. Why? And they would tell me and I would have a conversation with this person like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I didn't think about it. And uh, it happens even today. Um, things that things because because there's so many unique uh, people out there and unique perspectives out there. And um, it's hard for us to completely understand the um, the view, the, the sense of reality, um, the sense of perspective in every single type and group of person out there. Um, so we have to continually be learning and considering and, um, and, and bringing conversation so that we can do a better job to create the sense of belonging for everyone on our team. Best of luck to you. Be well. Yeah.